Welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data. Lecture one today, which is really an introduction into cloud computing and big data, more or less from a 10,000 feet perspective. And we clarified in the first part today that basically um, services is a very important term in cloud computing. It means something like having a user-friendly way of abstracting away um, lots of complicated computing elements, storage elements that you would otherwise have by dealing with computers as such. So essentially services means a very user-friendly way swiping your credit card, of course, to get, you know, uh, some payment done for the cloud providers, but then your user experience is usually very straightforward and you basically have a very nice, let's say, service that you can use on different levels. We talked about infrastructure as a service, for instance, where we had this EC2 examples, elastic computing cloud, so you can add or remove computing as your demand. Then we had the platform as a service where you as a cloud developer maybe want to create an app. And before starting from scratch of having billing services, of having storage services, of having lots of different, let's say, software developed, you just pick this different, you know, pick this different Lego bricks really together to build your own app which this platform idea of a cloud computing is also, you know, fueling a lot on a different level than the infrastructure as a service, which is more or less plain metal and hardware and services on the very lowest level. There on the platform as a service level, you have a platform character of reusing the so-called Lego bricks in my analogy or services which are already existing by creating a greater good for your own app. Uh, specific applications, as we have heard, like Angry Birds or the Philips Hue experience. Then on the top of the hierarchy of this infrastructure and platform as a service characters, on top, you would say there's a software as a service, which in the end just means you swipe your credit card again, but you have a full software at your disposal. Could be customer relationship management, could be enterprise resource planning, can be, you know, different elements where you pay for specific services for a specific kind. And we will talk throughout the lectures about these different services. We will see where are the differences on all these different levels. Admittedly to say um, today, these boundaries between EIS and you know PIS and SAS, these different levels might be a little bit, you know, vanishing because many of these Port, uh, kind of cloud providers really port different applications on different layers. They basically have lots of lots of services these days where it's hard to judge. Is it really a platform or maybe already just uh, infrastructure as a service or maybe it's both? But the hardest distinction can be probably still make when you do the software as a service character. And there we you know many examples you already use, either it's for free, like the Google Docs, of course, where the incentive is to buy more Google storage at some point in time, or basically other elements which we will look in the course. Well, the first part of this course hours today on lecture one is really based on cloud computing. We have now the second part um, of our lecture one, which is a little bit more focusing on the big data aspects of it and the scalability that we basically need for that. And which basically, you know, the demand is really given by big data for the scalability that we have in cloud computing today. So we shift the view a little bit from computing to storage to data. And it has been long time ago, a buzzword in science and engineering. So we have a big data problem here. But what it really means depends, really. In former times, there have been maybe megabytes and gigabytes. Today, we talk about petabytes and exabytes, which are always this interesting abbreviations, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. But the exact definition is, is in a way, really hard to find. And also from the practical perspective, which matters maybe much more, we could say that volume, which the name suggests, like big, right? Volume, big data is not really the key problem today. So if you think about, you know, large satellite data, we have lots of volume, but there's also lots of different information in it. The satellite is continuously going again and again, the sentinels, as we call them, the satellites going again and again around the globe. So basically getting data 24 seven, 
meaning lots of different data and incredible speed. So the velocity of data. So having more, let's say, data at abundance, not only in the volume direction, but also velocity. So we add to this every minute we speak, every minute we basically talk here, there's more data collected already with the satellite we want to analyze, especially in our field in remote sensing, we actively work in. Um, you will see that basically there is a huge um, advancement, not only in basically the speed that is available in terms of data, but also the kind of variety, different bands you look into the world or on the globe, basically with different uh, spectrums of light. So this is, enables you really a lot of variety in the data. We talk about multispectral data, hyperspectral data. And the course which is offered, you know, in from my dear colleague Gabrielle is looking into this much more deeply. So I still encourage you to take this course. We still have the possibility also to switch and basically also take other courses. But this course also here will, of course, show here and there remote sensing. But that course from Gabrielle, you also will have a very good idea of the details, what it means in remote sensing to really use satellite data, which is basically getting to more and more big data as we speak in all sorts of directions. So hence, what I want to leave you on the table is that the initial definition of big data as volume standing maybe for VVV, volume, velocity, and variety, is now currently extended to all sorts of Vs, veracity, validity, there's no end to it. And I think the, the idea is very clear if you think about also the web, not only satellite, which is very specific for a scientific domain maybe, or for NASA and other elements, ESA, the European Space Agency, and our activities. You also think generally the global information storage capacity. Um, we have 280 exabytes in the future, and this was already prognosed in 2007, and now we basically are there. There's lots of different challenges, how we store all that data. So it's a real problem these days. And this kind of normal database we had in the past um, is basically this traditional data processing more and more comes to an end. Also, when we use it with, let's say, machine learning methods, as I was alluding to in earlier lecture, like Prolog and so on, let's say the traditional learning models in some point in time with big data, the more you move to it, on this x-axis here, the more you move to big data, you have problems with serial, you know, laptop programs, SkyKit, Learn, Vika, Octave, MATLAB, whatever it is. So usually you have to spend more training time. You have to dive into much more scalable solution using high performance computing or cloud computing. And you have to pay the price for this computational footprint that you see here in red. However, it enables you with big data also new paradigms like deep learning. Deep learning is really fueled by big data in one respect where basically you really have more data to do interesting feature learning as we discussed earlier. And so big data is really there. And instead of a hoax or hype that it was earlier among my colleagues, we have now significant publications in that area. It has surpassed all computer vision algorithms we know in terms of basically do classification of maybe ground cover, earth cover in our field of remote sensing, but also in medicine and many other fields. So having, you know, kind of concrete big data challenges, though, is something we still have to, to look at. And you see here, again, another good example of saying the square kilometer array is a large scientific instrument where People said, oh, that's a big data problem. And then the people would directly say, well, that's creating a one petabyte. And everybody says, well, one petabyte, we have lots of storages um, in, in Jülich. We have, you know, lots of storages around the world and tape archives. So one petabyte is not a big problem. Huh? But what about it is a petabyte coming every 20 seconds? And then everybody is in silence because if it really comes in every 20 seconds, this is a problem. It really will basically fill, I mean, in a couple of months, almost all archives we have maybe in science very quickly available. We can make more available for a very short period of time, but at some, time, at some point in time, you have to think about that one petabyte per 20 seconds is hell a lot of velocity of that big data, right? So another good example of thinking the, the sheer size of it is not the biggest problem, one petabyte, but yeah, 
it accumulates quickly. And these days, what people want to do also to make it more challenging even is to make it really available for the broad public. So a statement that you will find very quickly close to big data these days is fair. Make it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which in large means sharing it with your peers, right? It should be not closed data. This is a scientific instrument for science, for, you know, basically the whole world for free, it should be. So make it fair is a movement, which means it has to be also in a way really, you know, reusable and accessible. And this is something which it poses another challenge, not only for the costs, also for the speed of retrieval of this data. And of course, then it goes to the equal way. That means also a certain degree it has to be open data, right? So it should be not in the hand of a couple of scientists doing their publications, rather than having it as open data, which is a strong movement today in science and engineering, at least of basically increasing degrees of open data, which should be fair, fair in the sense of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. <clears throat> Easier said than done, you would say, um, especially if you think about that this is not only the square kilometer array, it's also about the Large Hadron Collider, maybe at CERN that you see here, or the International Space Station, when gathering data, or the human brain simulations, and basically data gathered, or basically Earth simulations. So here we have another challenge to solve, which means how is the data open really? And this often requires federated security setups for sharing all of this data, where we also work a little bit in, in research in the past. So it's not at all that simple to say big data is there, the census is there, creating big data, everything is for free, everything is open, everything is fair. So we are not there yet. So this is really a, a big striking example of the community where everybody sort of agrees that this is needed. In the end, the scientific endeavors are often funded by, you know, taxpayers, so public data. So, of course, the taxpayer should get something in return of having it at least open so that all the scientists around the world can tackle this data, can work on this data. But we're not there yet. So there's lots of infrastructure issues. There are issues how to deal with big data. If you think you have a one petabyte brain, how you deal with this, right? You have a layered brain of different slices showing you all the kind of neural con you know neurological connections so it's a brain atlas you talk about right it's like the world but here we talk of a brain atlas it's a huge thing you cannot just put that on a usb drive and say here please please go with it and have your fun and analyze it so we talk about again services we talk about scalability of infrastructures to make that really happen to get this data readily accessible and then, of course, at the same time, gathering new data as we have here with a square kilometer array. Then another challenge what we have in big data is then you would say, well, we had big data in the past. And of course, everybody knows that memory is the fastest. If you would say uh, it's not really true, the real truth is that cache is, of course, the fastest. And even though registers, which are very, very, very close to the CPU, so we can't really count them here. But it's it's basically that caches and main memory would be just glorious to have. But there you go with the price, right? So the price of main memory to have a whole system with very good memory is incredible compared to the capacity that you would have in magnetic disks, optical disks, or even tape archives when you come really in the range of exabytes or petabytes. Hence, there is this kind of interesting pyramid where you say, of course, we can store lots of data here in the tape archives, but the biggest problem for processing is on the top of the pyramid. We have to go through all these so-called storage hierarchy layers and make, let's say, smart use of them in order to get the computing fast and basically deal with all this exabyte of data that we have today. And I think this is today one of the key issues, right? While this technology in computing advanced quickly, and let's say the HPM that we have very close to GPUs advance also luckily a little bit, we still have the problem that the storages are still a bit old school. So it's still tape archives, it's still main memory that we used to have cache along the processors and so on. So basically this not really had seen lots of different innovations in the past. So here's a little bit of bottleneck 
of thinking that more and more computing gets cheaper, more and more computing gets available. But the question we have today and the challenge here that you see is how we can get, you know, big data fast to the CPUs. And I think that's a key issue that we're working today in this big data domain. Do we tackle this? Some people call that the DRAM challenge, the memory wall that I was alluding to. So here you see again the processor having different la layers of cache, which are admittedly very fast, of course. And the memory here, at the layer three cache, also very fast. But the problem is that the capacity here um, basically grows, of course, but it's not really improved so much as we have in storage and the big data creation that we have, the development of all the sensors. It really develops quickly, more and more data is accumulated and so on. So here we talk about the memory wall problem that basically um, the excess time is now a bigger problem than maybe in the past where we think about, oh, we have to have computing enough. This basically is solved, especially with GPUs these days. But um, the problem remains how we can get, let's say, petabytes or excess bytes very quickly to the CPU. Hence, um, <clears throat> the key challenge is really this fast access for processing. I think that's what you really should you know, get in your brain these days, it's an open research question in the next decade, probably how we advance much more bare, better there, um, as opposed to in the last 10 years where we focus a lot of computing, where we had lots of good innovation from NVIDIA, from IMD and others that, you know, created the accelerators, which luckily also have some memory alongside it with HBM. But still those, and we will learn this in one of our lectures coming up, of course, these accelerators still have to find their way to fuel the data in the memory through the CPU, to the host CPU, as we call it. So still you have then the problem of this kind of memory slash storage gap that we face right now, which makes big data really a problem. Again, also, if you think about it, it's not only one petabyte, it's maybe one petabyte per 20 seconds. The storage technologies, however, luckily advanced. So we had magnetic disks in the past, now we have SDDs. I think generally we can say luckily this improved as well. And we see also with the internet and the connectivity, this all basically evolved as well. So here now even making it to the interesting part when you think about the energy and everything what we use, that instead of keeping a data set and storing it largely somewhere on your hard disk with a very nice hierarchy of finding this data again, it's much more faster these days to just download it again, download it again download it again, et cetera, et cetera. So of course this raises in a way energy concerns of saying how much you actually use the internet, how much you use remote uh, storage devices again to put out the data, but it's convenient these days, right? We just press on this PDF button and it comes again and we do this daily many times, or we press on this interesting streaming service and it gives us a series again and again over the internet, all is nice and shiny. So this really is to the rescue of big data and, of course, has fueled Netflix, has fueled Amazon Prime and the streaming services with a lots of lots of market value these days. So we see, of course, this is another, let's say, form of a cloud, right, just to be honest, as streaming services. And there, I mean, this is really fueled by the activities that we have these days, um, by all of these advancements that we have in storage and Internet. But a very smart idea of how we improve really the storage behind this is also not really kept. And if you look behind these streaming services, you will find oft that the hooks basically in the series are often there. So you would find the first series is there. But when you want to have all seven series or basically the episodes of all of them, basically it's not accessible in this particular streaming service. So they hook you off with one or two series in the beginning but basically the rest is not there yet. It may become if the last users look at it. But it also shows that there is not this abundance of storage which you think. So behind the scene, of course, also even the big ones like Netflix, Amazon Prime and others, they have to look what the storage costs are. They have to think how we can make the best service possible for the limited amount of storage we in the end have. It sounds dubious because we have, you know, kind of 4K, 
We have HD, we have beautiful resolutions online. We have incredible speed. I can just search something on Netflix, get the streaming service indirect directly on you know my handheld device. I can have it on my TV, wherever. But still behind that is, let's say, lots of learning, how people use the data. It's a smart infrastructure of these, you know, content delivery platforms, as we would sort of say them. Basically, there's nothing else. It's a content delivery platform. And basically, in this sense, they also have the same big data problems as everyone else. Otherwise, we would have all series, all movies ever watched already on this, you know, Netflix or an Amazon Prime. But of course, you don't have that because they also have to look at this particular challenge. So needless to say, um, we in science have the same problems, right? So there is EOSC to the rescue a little bit, the European Open Science Cloud, which is a little bit an angle now away from Netflix and Amazon, more to the research idea of thinking about how we can make research data sets, scientific data sets and engineering data sets we have basically FAIR. Again, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, as you by know now. And I think this is the word you really need to know by heart if you want to go into the academic environment. These days, if you want to publish journals, if you want to publish big papers, usually the reviewers want to see the data fair, right? They want to see how we can make it reusable, your experiment. Do you really got 98% accuracy in the machine learning model? Show us where's the data, where are the scripts showing this? And where's the computing where it takes place? Is it a data format that we can also interpret? Is it closed data? These are all questions which makes, you know, data fair and should be tackled. Hence, in Europe, there's a big project on European Open Science Cloud. We will tackle this in lecture 10 a little bit, which is sort of at the SaaS area. You can argue it's a bit on the platform level, but in the end, still, it's the idea of service providers that deliver, let's say, certain services like be to safe here. You see, for example, or be to stage for different ideas of replicating data or staging data between different sites. Um, we will look into this in lecture 10, how also researchers, you know, benefit essentially from the science cloud a little bit, um, just to contrast it to the commercial ones. On the commercial um, side of things on storage, it's a very known service as S3. So that's why I bring it here as a, let's say, mostly used or broadly used storage as a service um, called S3. It's basically Amazon um, key storage system. But when you have to have, you know, some sort of kind of service bought from Amazon, chances are that the data around that service will be stored in S3. It's a certain interface which enables you not only a service to really, you know, drag and drop, do it manually. It has also a REST interface, representational state transfer, and also the simple object access protocol, SOAP transfer interface to it in order to enable web services really interacting to create your own API with it. And the idea of this S3, which made it also successful, really, especially in the beginning, now there you feel, find much more realization of such a bucket store. But the idea is really just have a bucket, have a key value pair saying, okay, that's what we want to have there, a bit of metadata and access control. So you just store anything inside. And the beautiful thing, which means for one S in this S3, it's scalable. So you don't care about the size of the bucket. You just store it and it will grow automatically. Of course, S3 also has the nice idea of while you're paying for it to be very secure, very durable. People talk about 99.9% .9 performance, right? And uptime. While we used to say in computer science, in generally, there's never 100%, which also I think is a good example that Amazon reflects that here. There's 99.99999 at whatever of durability. Uh, in computer science, there's no 100% guarantee always. But, you know, here we talk about a replicated service storage. We talk about a very secure storage. So cracking this will be already not so easy if you configure it right. So it's a very known storage and fuels a hell of a lot of applications. I think also in one respect, we had great scope, for instance, that some students may know here 
using the S3 interface, for instance, for storing all the exams in the cloud. And then that we did for basically, um, you know, kind of corrections and grading and so on. Just as an example, as a cloud service, you can, you know, connect to maybe if you are already in your masters that have used great scope in the past in some courses. So again, this is fueled on virtualization. In lecture four, we'll talk about virtualization really. It's not key to understand it right now, but the bucket interface here is really, or the bucket service is really something which made the service very successful and also the scalable notion in it. So I don't care how big the kind of bucket is. Sometimes it has to shrink, sometimes it has to grow. But basically you have here some ideal service that basically is used by many different players from Airbnb, Netflix, over to NASA, et cetera. So very famous service. We will talk again and again about this when we talk about different layers. What we didn't really discuss yet is building your own cloud. So what happens if you know, you know, your boss comes into the door and I was actually alluding to this already in the prologue when I said, well, now you create your own cloud, right? So please do something for us. And you know, basically you don't want to store your data maybe in the Amazon or Azure or cloud from Google, but you want to have it on premise, your own little one in the company. So what you do, you go to OpenStack. It's basically a cloud software or an operating system of sort for clouds where you find many different, let's say services and ideas how to host your systems as a cloud service already implemented. So you see here your standard hardware that, of course, you need to have on premise then, right, within your own company, your standard hardware, speaking of compute, storage, networking. Then you would have this open stack shared services, which then leverage this really standard hardware, make it virtualized in the open stack environment and accessible via APIs to basically different applications in your company. There's a Swift service, which is nothing else than an object storage which can be, you know, scale out and scale in. We have a Cinder service that can have this block storage. And this is just examples in the storage domain. And Manila for just having pure file access that you maybe already know. And this is just a storage domain. We will talk in lecture 13 then how you can make use on this in compute in different ideas with containers and with, you know, virtual machines and so on. It's a bit early to talk about this, but for storage, you see a little bit already that is nice to have the services and then you can expose your hardware storage that you have already in different ways to your own company. And that makes OpenStax quite broadly used and we will talk more about it in lecture 13. Just a different perspective that we will tackle in this course. Other big data examples like online social networking will be also tackled for us um, later in the course in lecture 14 and also shifts the view a little bit to the idea of how to work with unstructured data in a sense that it's not anymore a relational database management system. Everything is beautiful, nicely. You have a name, an ID, an address, etc., a bank account number. Here we talk about data that is growing in different directions. If you know Facebook, you know what I'm talking about, and YouTube, right? So this is growing in different directions. There are trends, there are influences dragging the content in one direction much more massively than you know in certain other directions. And this is true for actually almost all the online social networking sites, you know, it's getting to different directions, making it a little bit appearing like this interesting set of blocks here, right, which shows this unnatural growth and or natural growth, so to speak, in different areas, right, but not really in a typical relational database idea, everything is a table, everything is nice, and so on. On top, you want to have high performance, you want to have to have a like of a friend, to be viewed and seen directly. So you have a kind of more graph-based idea how things are actually interacting with each other. So we talk about this, how this as a mesh rather represents a graph, which is one way of tackling this big data. And that's how the work is actually done by this large social networking sites. They have also different databases, different indexes to enable sorting quickly, searching in data very quickly. And this, of course, enables them to be so, let's say, responsive of saying a like is directly seen, although they have lots of lots of users, billions of users. So hence, what I wanted to show a little bit here is the role of scalability, right? Of course, this goes one 
to one in hand with you know networking with internet with having a better bandwidth but here we're really talking about um we have a very decentralized approach to this right so basically we are talking about a distributed system there's lots of different data fueled from different basically geographical servers or geographical dispersed servers i should say around the world and I'm also making it then scalable and data locality is then the idea that really in the sense drived and moved this cloud paradigm ahead we talked about big data analytics where we think now the time of you know shipping all the data to a high performance computer you know like in Jülich like in Barcelona Mare Nostrum or wherever else in the world these times are there here and there and for some data sets but if you think about Facebook accumulating data or Google accumulating with their searches and so on, accumulating data in an incredible speed, it doesn't make sense anymore to transfer terabytes and petabytes again and again over the Internet, although it's fast these days. But it doesn't make sense to transfer petabytes, even if the Internet is now fast, you know that transferring petabytes over petabytes is still a lot, a lot of data which you have to pay for which takes hell a lot of time to transfer even in terabytes. Hence, the idea of shifting to a paradigm called the data locality paradigm was eminent of saying we have to work more locally, we have to do more moderate computing maybe, but this avoids to have, let's say, the big data always shipped to the big computers. Hence, this kind of idea of moving the compute task to the data right instead of moving the data to compute once more again so that you realize it so instead of moving basically the data to computing we now think about here and there in this paradigm how we can have compute tasks moved to the data so that we don't have to do the big data transfers but rather create you know smaller computings uh, directly at the data site where the data is accumulated and this coined the MapReduce paradigm, which we'll talk in the course in lecture five. There will be basically an assignment around it, which really makes sense of this overall idea. And in this context, people talk lots of big data analytics, like, you know, what's the difference between data analysis? And data analytics is often, um, you know, something where it's rather correlation, where, you know, you do quick methods you try to do big data analytics um, very fast. You use enabling technology, infrastructure, scalability, whatever you can to get and derive data quickly. However, data analysis in the depth still has a search for causality. So here the analytics was put in contracts of saying it's not only simple correlation. So people really have, you know, looked at this a long time. They understood the data. They have a causal relationship in the data that we really understand the data, but it's slow. It's, you know, sometimes often error prone, time consuming, going us to down the wrong path to search. And their big data analytics was to the rescue and saying, well, we can now look at big data and the quantity stands for itself, but warnings on that. And I have a warning example application here uh, based on the H1N1, admittedly a little bit long ago, but still captures the essence where people have said, yeah, let's play and use a Google, you know, search strings just to analyze how to predict the winter flu on this and see, um, we really can see with a Google search what we have accumulated in data when people searching for influenza and epidemics and so on, uh, we can actually see that on the regional scale. And if you task a kind of health authority with this, of course, it will be quickly outnumbered to doing that that fast. Hence, People have thought this would be the new big data analytics um, solving everything um, very quickly. But of course, there was no causality in the sense, because in the end, the parable of the Google flu came then later in this publication that you see that even people have just called by phone the other West Coast to the East Coast that I am actually sick and I have this and this, I have the flu. And then people on the other side of the ocean have basically, or the other side of the continent really have than done the search strings, but being not sick at all. They just phoned with someone somewhere else. There are lots of problems in the data. This was not really transparent. Uh, it was not replicable. So in the end, 
there was a big trap in this kind of big data analytics, which has been done very fast. Hence, you have to look at this precisely. However, it's still also a movement at that time, which lasts until today, that basically you have this MapReduce paradigm, a data replication, which you have a very specific distributed file system, which makes it happen that you see here. We will talk in one lecture about it called the Hadoop distributed file system. And up top, you have large distributed processing engine that make use of in-memory to make it very fast, like Spark, for instance, in contrast to pure Hadoop. The difference between them is not obvious to you. We will see how that materializes in one of the future lectures, obviously. But you see here that MapReduce is really a paradigm that is basically implemented also in Spark. And Spark alone is much more faster, for instance, one of the logistic regression tests, sort of machine learning algorithm. And there are lots of practical applications that make use of Apache Spark, like you see here in one of our examples in remote sensing, for instance, using it with an encoder or decoder strategy. The key paradigm, obviously, is not very new. So you have a divide and conquer. You have one problem, you have several worker nodes, and then they basically they gather results. And we will talk in this, of course, in more detail in lecture five. But the key message to take away is that basically this MapReduce paradigm is fueled by a very smart intermediate layer, layer that's often forgotten. So it's not MapReduce. As I say always, it's a three-step map short shuffle group reduce paradigm. Right, so this step in between is very powerful, implemented in Hadoop, and we will talk about this, of course, in lecture five. But this was kind of the big data analytics frameworks, which are very, let's say, commonly known. And it advanced basically to a whole stack of Apache systems. We will talk already in lecture three about it. The Hadoop stack or the Apache stack, so to speak, not only with Spark, there are many different services which nicely work together with cloud services which offer very powerful libraries we will talk about, all based on a very reliable file system, like, for instance, the HDFS. Um, we will talk about in the upcoming lecture very, um, you know, shortly, and which has very specific properties of really supporting this paradigm of moving the computers rather to the data instead of moving the whole data to the compute engines, as we have done traditionally. So then the idea of big data is really intertwine really this kind of data that I've accumulated with machine and deep learning. That's why it's so prominent in the course. So there's machine and deep learning as we already had a little bit in the, let's say, prologue. So I just don't spend much more time on it. You have seen there are different, let's say, methods to this classification, clustering and regression. In lecture two, we will already start with a very, let's say, easy into, yeah, introduction really to machine learning models. And we will see that essentially with classification, um, we have a very interesting algorithm already in machine learning of dis differentiating basically if one particular point is belonging to class A or class B. Obviously, um, in higher, let's say, classification problems, you have much more data, much more classes to solve. But this is something what we will actually focus on the next time. So. Talk about learning approaches, then what we will tackle very soon is that we will understand to have a new flower image and we'll understand, okay, is this image now the Iris of Cetosa or Iris Virginica? So I think normally the people don't really can quickly assess this as a human. And it's the same problem you have in our remote sensing when you have pulpa spectral channels, which makes it the block we look into the earth, but to understand the land cover. So is this a soybean field? Is it a typical corn field? Is it water, a building? These are things we're interested in. And we focus a little bit in the beginning on the supervised learning and we'll also contrast it with unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning throughout the next lectures. So, and we will try to see really how Microsoft Azure is doing this with the so-called HD Insight stack um, that we have basically available, which means lots of different open source tools, but they're already nicely bundled together in the right versions to make machine learning and deep learning happening. We will talk about this also very soon in the upcoming lecture. It's also related to your assignment. So speaking then and summarizing this a little bit, when you want to use it with HD Insight, you would basically have, of course, um, your laptop not making it anymore. You have a CPU or GPU, but maybe the memory problems has a sort of storage limits as well. So you check your subscription. You will deploy a so-called Spark cluster in HD Insight. We will learn this very soon, what that means using a specific template. 
then you use a Jupyter notebook that you already know with a specific Spark kernel, PySpark really, to use it with Apache Spark. You create a session in Spark, you have your application, you will initialize the data, you analyze the data that you have here, perform a machine learning model on the Spark cluster to see, can I classify this flower now automatically in class A or B? And basically, of course, with the parameters and so on that you have for this machine learning, when you really do is you have some evaluation and refinement. And this is the kind of stepwise approach that follows again and again. And of course, the first one is loaded with subscription that we also tackle very soon. We try to make it here free, of course, for you in the course. Right, so this was a lot of information from 10,000 feet. And of course, admittedly, some pointers now also to the next lecture coming up on the next two, three lectures, which have all the idea of bringing you closer to machine learning. A nice summary here is also in this video thing about how big data analytics can be used in the commercial setup. Banks face many challenges as they strive to return to pre-2008 profit margins. These challenges include reduced interest rates, instability in financial markets, tighter regulations, and lower performing assets. Fortunately, banks taking advantage of big data and analytics and generate new revenue streams with personalized offers, targeted cross-sell, and improved customer service. Big data and analytics provide more insight by analyzing a higher volume and variety of data types from more sources than ever before. Deeper insight by digging deeper into customer information and behavior, enabling segment of one marketing. And faster insight by performing real-time analysis of customer information to deliver offers at the point of decision. Big Data and Analytics can analyze many types of customer information including spending patterns, behavior, channel usage, product portfolio, bank interactions, credit information, social media, and customer profitability. Here's a day in the life customer scenario as an example of Big Data and Analytics in action. Peter is a customer of leading bank with a mortgage, checking and savings accounts, and a line of credit. Peter is remodeling his kitchen and decides to buy a new set of chef knives. The bank recognizes that Peter has made a number of household purchases lately and analyzes his financial and transactional data, including spending patterns, income, savings balance, available credit, loans, credit score, and level of risk. The bank also analyzes his related activity on social media and learns that Peter loves to cook, he enjoys gourmet restaurants, he blogs about his dining experiences and indicates he likes a new restaurant-style gas stove. Using big data capabilities and predictive analytics, the bank anticipates similar home purchases, but knows that Peter is nearing his credit limit. The bank wants to seize this business opportunity before Peter is offered a credit card from a retailer. The bank sends Peter an offer to extend his line of credit. He uses the additional credit to buy the professional-style stove for his kitchen. The banking system also identifies this as a large purchase and prompts Peter to take and archive a photo of the receipt and warranty. As well, the system recognizes this as a home appliance purchase and offers an extended warranty to Peter based upon his zip code. It's now 11.30 a.m. Analyzing Peter's regular lunchtime purchase behavior and preferences, the bank sends him a personalized offer from one of leading banks nearby merchants, Chefwich. The system prompts Peter to share the offer with his friends through social media. As Peter pays his bill, the bank sends an alert to verify that he has authorized the purchases made today, preventing fraudulent charges to his account. Later, Peter logs into his account with his tablet computer. He looks in My Offers to find his personalized offers. After analysis of his spending patterns, the bank suggests that Peter sign up for their Smart Sweep service. Peter also sees a home equity line of credit offer based on an analysis of his financial condition as well as information on his home from third-party sources. Finally, the bank recommends that Peter sign up for overdraft protection to avoid the frustration of any future fees. While Peter is logged into his account, he also views the Spending Manager feature to gain insight into how his spending changes from month to month. Peter can compare his spending to financial peers in his geographic location, income, and age bracket. With new capabilities provided by big data and analytics, banks can develop new products and services that help customers manage their finances and save them money. 
deliver relevant services and offers that fit seamlessly with customers' daily lives. Improve the customer experience and promote customer satisfaction and retention. And at the same time, generate new streams of revenue for the bank. All right, so that was all for our introductionary cloud computing lecture today. The next time we will really dive more into machine learning basics to really leverage big data a bit from the really, let's say, algorithm point of view. So see you next time.